Well, good morning. <clears throat> oh, I got to tell you, it's been um, it's been quite the the week to say the least. Um, the devil has been attacking, uh, on many fronts, uh, in my life and my family's life and in many of your lives as well. Um, this week, our two year old washing machine broke. Now, that may not seem like a big deal, but when there's seven of you living in one house, that's, that's a lot of laundry. Um, wood stove, trying to get that working again, and can't get the right parts, so still no wood stove. Um, I've been having these issues that I've, that I've shared with you about um, the numbness and the tingling and the burning in, in my uh, hands and elbows and knees and feet. And um, Wednesday, we were down... Uh, no, sorry, Tuesday, we were down seeing Nick, and I started getting it in my face, and so that evening when we got home, uh, I started doing some research, and um, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you know that you should never find your doctor on Google? <laughs> but some of the other symptoms that I had had, uh, they said you need to go immediately because it could be stroke, so I t showed Shelly, I said, we probably should go. I was fighting it, but, you know, her, her smarter head prevailed. And we went, ruled out stroke, brain tumor, and um, uh, heart issues, which you all know I have heart issues. Um, and so, fast forward, my doctor gets me in on Friday or Thursday and, and does an MRI on Friday of my brain and my neck trying to figure out what's going on. Um, so, so I've been dealing with that, a lot of, a lot of stuff there. Um, and, and, and so fast forward to yesterday, I had been dealing with it all day long. And I just didn't tell anybody because uh, for those of you who know me well know that you don't have to shake your head that adamantly. Um, you know that I'm always going to be the toughest guy. I'm always going to be the one that's there for everybody else at the expense of myself. Um, I'm the one who um, is just uh, takes on the weight of the world. And um, so I didn't tell anybody all day. And um, we prayed at 6 and 9 and 12 and 3 and 6. About 10 or 15 till six yesterday evening I came in here and I started on my knees at the altar and I was praying and I'd been doubting all day and I was like God I'm trying to be strong and I'm getting ready to go to Kenya and all these different things and the doctor tells me by the way don't go to Kenya <laughs> and um I'm like, God, what's going on? And then I'm laying on the altar. I'm literally laying on the altar. And I heard this song come from the back somewhere. And um, it was casting cr crowns. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. And um, I popped my head up trying to figure out where this was coming from. And start walking back the aisle. There was nobody back there, so I knew it wasn't anybody back there. The sound system and everything was off, so I knew it wasn't that. So I walk out in the lobby, and, and Joy and uh, Ellie were in the lobby, and, and uh, Joy was playing this song. And I said, were you playing that song? And she said, yeah. And um, I said, can you play it again? She said, yeah. And um, so... She started playing it, and I just sat in the chair for 15 minutes and bawled like a baby. Um, 
I'm pretty positive. I don't really know for sure because uh, I've never really looked at myself, but I'm pretty sure I probably got one of the ugliest cries around. And that was me for about 15 minutes. And the Lord had already told me that I needed to be prayed over and anointed again. And I fought it because I didn't want to tell anybody because I didn't want the day to be about me. And um, so Jamie had told Shelly, she says, in my opinion, I think we need to gather around Casey and pray. So I said, okay, I hear you, Lord. And we did. And um, that was the most powerful prayer time I've ever been a part of. And one of the things that uh, Dave and Jane Kelly had came, and they were here around three and got to pray with us. And one of the things that he had prayed for, uh, for me, was for me to hear the angels singing, hear heaven. Before we started praying, I, I asked Joy to play that song in the group here. And they, everyone's kind of gathered around me right here. And she played that song. And by the second or third chorus, everyone was singing. And... I opened my eyes and just kind of looked around because for a moment I thought I was in heaven. And it was the most beautiful sound I've ever heard in my almost 41 years of life. And I just closed my eyes and listened. <clears throat> and so I know God's using this for many reasons. And one of the things the Lord had told me earlier in the week. With Nick, God was using that to bring the church together. And then all of this starts coming out about me. I've been dealing with it since December. And I just haven't told anybody. And one of the things God told me earlier in the week was that. He's using this to bring the church together. And um, I promise you, I, and I beg you to know that I am not trying to make any of this about me. I sat on it for months because I didn't want that to be anybody's thought. So I beg you, please know that is not my heart. But I do covet your prayers. And I know God's got this. And um, so Friday, I knew I had that MRI in the afternoon. And I was trying to determine what the sermon was because we finished all the, the, the five weeks on fasting. And I'm like, all right, God, show me. <clears throat> and I knew he wasn't telling me to write something new. It was um, something that I've already preached before. And so I started looking at sermons, and, and I'm going through all these different sermons. And I'm like, okay, 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 not it, not it, not it, not it. And finally I got to this one that we're going to hear this morning. And... Um, As I was, as I was reading through, God told me I had to confess something to my wife. <laughs> and so, I called her in to my office. Well, first she was having some stomach issues and stuff from, from uh, fasting. And, and God said, pray over her and tell her. And I said, okay. So I called her in my office and we sat down. And I pray over her and, I, and I'm bawling. And I told Scott and Alicia this morning, I said, I'm surprised, which I'm not because God's got it. But I'm surprised over the last month that I have not got dehydrated from the amount of tears I have cried. And... And so I'm bawling like a baby, which has been normal lately. And I said, I got to tell you something. And I had to confess some sins to my wife. And it was one of the hardest things I have ever done in my entire life. God had been telling me for two months. And I didn't want to. 
I didn't want to tell her. And I'm not going to share with you what it is. God told me not to. But he did tell me that I've got to share with you. And I will tell you that my wife was so gracious and so godly. And that broke me even more. Because I fully expected some wrath, which I deserved. And he told me, if I'm going to preach this message today, y'all got to know that it starts here. And I'm not standing up here telling you this for you to think I'm something great because I fucked God for two months. I would not listen. But he finally broke me enough that I said, I got to. And she has been so godly. So gracious. And I am in awe of how God is moving in her life. And again, I'm not putting either of us on a pedestal. Please do not think that. And so as we go through this message, I want you to take some serious account of your life. I want you to be real with God. I want you to realize that if God's calling you to something, he's already made a way. And you know, I think back to the courage of Luke and Alex and Mike Helm, when for all these years they've been playing Christian. And they weren't really saved. The courage for them to come up and say, you know what, I've been playing and I'm not really saved. And I think about Davin going blind for 12 hours yesterday and Selena going deaf for 12 hours to hear and see God more clearly. And I think about the the way God is moving in, in your lives. And I think about just how amazing what's coming is going to be because of people willing to do the hard things. And if we're not willing to do the hard things, God's not willing to do the big things in our lives. And so as we get ready to hear a message about personal revival. It's fitting that for five weeks we've talked about fasting. We're halfway in a month of fasting as a church. Many of you started early and praise God for that. Many of you are still in the middle of fast. But it's so fitting that we talk about personal revival. Because if we're going to have a revival of the Holy Spirit in this church, it starts with each and every one of us. I apologize to my wife, and I apologize to you. And it's not sin that should get me, you know, moved out of ministry. Don't, don't think that. But it is an apology that I am sorry for. And I just pray that each and every one of us can have the courage To let the Spirit of God move in our lives so magnificently and powerfully that those secret sins that we've all been holding on to will start confessing and getting rid of 
in our lives. All right, our scripture text this morning comes out of Ezra chapter 9, verses 5 through 9. If you believe in the word of God, if you have a yearning to respect the authority of the word of God in your life, and you want to show God how much he means, then I invite you to stand if you're physically able. For the reading of God's holy word. Ezra chapter 9. Verses 5 through 9. At the evening sacrifice. I arose from my fasting. And having torn my garment and my robe. I fell on my knees. And spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said oh my God. I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you. My God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty, and for our iniquities we, our kings, And our priests have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation as it is this day. And now for a little while, (laughs) grace has been shown from the Lord our God. (laughs) Listen. To leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place. That our God may enlighten (laughs) our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. For we were slaves... Yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild in its ruins and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. Let us pray. Oh, God Almighty, I need your strength right now, Lord. I am so weak, Father. I am emptied of myself, Father. I have been overcome in emotion. I have been overcome by your spirits working, Father. Fill me now. Bind the demons that have come to oppress me, Father. In the name and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, bind them and cast them out now, Father. And Lord, we just pray that you will bless the reading and hearing of your holy word in the hearts and minds of your people here today, Father. If there's any unsaved under my voice, that today would be the day of salvation, that they will not run away any longer, but run to the throne of the King of kings and Lord of lords and fall down on their knees and say, I need Jesus. And Father, if there's any backslidden, Lord, we all have those secret sins. Today, reveal them. Bring about a confession among these people. Bring about an enlightening in these people. Bring about a forgiveness in these people. Bring about a work of your Spirit that has never been seen among these people, my Lord, my God. Move with your Spirit like a mighty rushing wind. Father, let your wind blow now. Speak and preach with authority through me in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Have you had church yet? Have you felt the Spirit of God move in your life this morning? Have you been expectant to hear God? 
Have you been expectant to let the Word of God change you and mold you today? Have you come ready to praise the King and, and, and Jesus? Have you come ready for a revival in your life? You see, friends, the world is shaking. And I don't mean that figuratively. I mean that literally. I mean that the world is quaking and shaking. And there's over 25,000 dead in Turkey and Syria. There's been earthquakes all around the world. A, a volcano erupted two days after the earthquake in Japan. Many of you probably never even heard that, but there has been rumblings. There has been shakings. God is waking things up and saying, Get ready because my King, my Jesus, is about to return. And you, my friends, have been called to be a remnant. As bondage has taken over this country in drugs and sex and slavery and uh, all these different things that have taken over in America, we have been called to be a remnant for Jesus Christ. And friends, if God is going to move like I believe He wants to move in the midst of this people, you, then you're going to have to have a revival in your heart, your mind, and your soul. Revival is going to have to break out in each of you. I can't make it happen. I can't make you fast. I can't make you come to church services. I can't make you read your word. I can't make you pray. I can't make you do these things. But the Holy Spirit has been beating you all up. Am I right about it? Come on now. Am I right about it? Has the Holy Spirit been working in your lives? If He's not working in your lives, you're the problem. You're the problem. Friends, I love you. I love each and every one of you. To me, you're beautiful. I don't care what you see in the mirror, but I see beauty when I see you because you were fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of Jesus Christ and you are born again and God loves you. And if God loves you, I love you. I don't always like you. I ain't gonna lie to you. But I sure do love you. But here's the deal, friends. Here's the deal. This country was founded on Judeo-Christian beliefs. And we have gone so far from that. You know, the earthquake was happening in Turkey and Syria. You know what it was on American news and TV channels at the exact same time? I'm not even going to mention the heathen's name. Not even going to say the name, but there was a guy dressed up as the devil, and he had uh, women half-naked stripping and dancing and doing all these things. Twelve million people tuned in to watch that live. And you know what? CBS, who put it on, tweeted, for all you folks who don't have social media, that's a Twitter thing. You tweet. It's stupid. It makes no sense to me, but that's what everybody's doing. But anyways... He said he was getting ready to dress up the devil, as the devil and do all this stuff. And CBS said, we can't wait to worship with you. They blatantly just said they're worshiping the devil. And, and they have since taken it down. So if you go look for it. But there's plenty of screenshots because the internet keeps it out there. That is showing exactly what was going on at the Grammys. And by the way, I just want to let you know... Um, you know who sponsored that event? Pfizer. Yeah, let that sink in. I'm not going to go down that road, but anyways, here's the deal. This country is so far from God. Let me, let me share something with you. As a matter of record, in 1782, the United States Congress voted this resolution. The Congress of the United States recommends and approves the Bible for use in all schools. Friends, people are fighting to even let kids take their Bibles to school. Gideons can't go in schools anymore. They can stand on sidewalks. But if that gets a complaint, they got to go off the sidewalk on, on other places around the country. Uh, in Minneapolis, the biggest mall in America, a guy had a shirt on that said, uh, I can't remember exactly, something about Jesus. And the mall security made him leave because his shirt said, Jesus. So you know what they did? A bunch of people showed up with shirts that said Jesus. Hundreds of people. 
hundreds of people. I wish I'd have known. I wish I'd known. So we could have gone. Arrest me. Arrest me. Go ahead. I'll go to jail. You might lose your job, Pastor. Who cares? Who cares? God will provide. Are you at that place in your life that you're done with the evil? Are you at that place in your life when you're sick and tired of it? I'm getting ahead of myself, so I better slow, slow my roll here. I'm going to preach the rest of the message. Listen. Go back. Go back. Go back. It ain't, it ain't listening to me, so I'm, I'm telling Ron. Seven. Verse seven, there we go. Look at this. We are literally living out verse seven. I want y'all to read this with me. In the red it says have if you can't read that. I'm going to start and I want y'all to jump in and we're going to read this verse seven together because America is living this. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty. And for our iniquities, we, our kings, our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation as it is this day. Hey, we haven't been given over to kings of the lands. Did y'all know China's been putting stuff in our airways and our, our skies? They're laughing at us. Literally, the, the president of China mocked Biden, which, I mean, I understand. But he's still our president. Duly elected or not, he's our president. And so here's the deal, friends. They're mocking us. They're laughing at us. And if you think that isn't a preparation for what's to come, you're mad. You're lost it. They're preparing. They're getting ready. This, we're living this out. We should be guilty. We are guilty in the eyes of God as a nation. We have made a mockery. Churches and churches and churches are making a mockery. They're taking crosses out. They're putting people who aren't even saved on stage to be musicians. They're not even Christians. But they'll pay them $1,000 a week because they can play good music. You so say you're going to let the devil stay on stage and play music? Wow. That's what they're doing. We have made a mockery of the name of Jesus Christ. We are living out and we are guilty. Our iniquities have gone above our heads all the way up to the heavens. But you see, we're, we've got a little bit of grace, verse 8 right now. We've got a little grace, but not much longer. Not much longer. And so if you want to be prepared for what's coming. I guess I got a point. We've got to get spiritually prepared for revival. If you want to be prepared for what's coming, we got to be prepared personally. Remember, this is personal revival. This is on you. I'm giving you the message. You take it or leave it. You, you listen to the word and you say, I'm going, to, I'm going to take it. I'm going to receive it and I'm going to let it change me. Or you go, man, that, that feels pretty good. I, I understand what he's saying, but I don't really want to do the hard things. I don't want to confess. I don't want to do these things then that's when you and God's weapons will come. And I promise you, you will regret it. I promise you that. So we need spiritual revival. I'm going to ask that one more time. And if you agree that you need it in your life, we need it in this church and we need it as a country, I want you as loud as you can, after I ask this question, to yell amen. Do you believe we need spiritual revival? Thank you. You see, because if you're in the right frame of mind to receive this message, God's going to do things in your life. All right, so let's get to it now. The psalmist understood what spiritual preparation means for revival. Psalm 85, 13, righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. You see, if you're spiritually right, God's going to go before you and prepare the way. That has been my prayer for two weeks. And, and I did not realize that God was going to have me preach a message four days before I leave. But I've been praying, God, go before me and prepare the way. God, go before me. And then I get to this Friday and I'm just I'm sobbing like a little crybaby. I'm like, oh, God, oh, God, you've been having me pray that. You know how I do. Y'all know how I do. Oh. 
I was like that Friday, wasn't I? Yeah. But here's the thing. If you're living right, God's not going to do this if you're not living right. If you've got sin in your life, God's not going to go before you. He's not going to prepare the way. He's not going to say you're righteous. He's not going to open doors for you. He's going to say, why am I going to use you when you keep living in sin? Why am I going to use you when you keep allowing sin in your life? You know, some of us, we get to this place where we see God move and, you know, we started way down here and we get right here and we're like, man, God's moving. This is amazing. And we get so used to it and we love it and we're like, all right. And then all of a sudden, instead of keep growing, what we do is we go like this. We go backwards. Backwards. Everybody say it with me, backwards. You take the W out, it's backwards. And that's what happens in our lives. We get to this place and God's on the move and we're like, woo, yeah, God's moving. I'm on fire for Jesus, woo, woo, yeah. And then we get to, you know, on this level playing field and all of a sudden we get over here and we're like, nobody's looking, nobody's looking. We were up there. Jesus was moving. We were doing stuff. And then one day we wake up and we're like, man, how did I get back here? Like I was up there. God was using me. Like I was doing stuff. God was touching lives through me. The gifts of the Spirit were moving. And then it seems like we take this trajectory like this to get where we were. Can anybody relate? We get back here, and instead of going up straight, which is, this message will get you straight forward, okay? If you do these things, you'll go straight forward. But what we do is we go like this. Three months later, we made it to where we were when we could have went in a day. We could have went in a day right where we were. But we're so stubborn. Come on, raise your hands if you're with me. All right, thank you. Thank you for your honesty. We're so stubborn. And, and we make all these reasons. Yesterday, I didn't want to make it about me. I, I didn't want to worry about anybody else. I, you know, all these different things. God said you need to tell them. Stubborn. It wasn't pride. I wasn't like, oh, I'm so tough. It wasn't that yesterday. It was just stubbornness. And in... He says, your righteousness will go before you. But are you living righteous? Are you living righteous? Are you living the way God has called you to be? Are you living and doing the things that God has called you to do? When the Israelites were getting ready to go on the eve of their passage to cross the Jordan River to go to the promised land, you, can you imagine They've been wandering the desert for 40 years. They've been in captivity to Egypt for 400 plus years. Paganism was part of Israel. The night before they were getting ready to cross, Joshua charged the people this right here. He says, Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. You see, this fast has been a consecration. Uh, and if you don't know what consecration means, it means a setting apart. It means I'm setting myself apart for the work of something. I'm going to consecrate you to do God's work. And so God says, you need to consecrate yourselves. It's on you, Israel. He doesn't say, I'm going to do it, and it's just going to like you know take effect across. you got to step up and do it yourselves. He says, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. That's where we're at. We are at a pivotal point as a church. Here's where we're at. Let, let me just put it as clearly as I know how for you. Tomorrow, Monday, the next Monday, three weeks from now, a month from there. You see, in God's Joshua 3, 5 for us, it means not just the physical tomorrow, but the days and weeks and months coming. Okay? Get that in your minds. Here's where we're at. We're on a teeter-totter. Everybody remember those from when you were kids? 
We're in the middle. We're at a pivotal point. This way, God's going to do wonders. And we're going to see this place explode. We're going to feel the wall shake, the roof come off. We're going to see amazing things. But if you don't get right with God, if you don't allow personal revival in your life, if God doesn't move in you and you allow him, then we're going to be on the other side of the teeter-totter. And God's wrath on you and this church will be unbelievable. It won't be on me. You say, wait a minute, you're, you're our leader. Absolutely. But you see, God's broke me. I've done the things I've been needing to do. And now I'm calling you to that. And did you notice at the beginning of this Ezra 9 and verse 5, it said at, at the end of the fast, at the time of sacrifice. So do you think it's amazing that tomorrow my fast ends? Some of you have already been ending. Some of you have time left to go. But in the middle of the month of the fast, God gives us this message. Do you think that's a coincidence? Or do you see God incidents in the middle of this? That's what I see, is that God is in the middle of this. And so what I'm telling you today is that each and every one of you need to consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. God is going to do amazing things. You need to get yourselves ready for the move of the Spirit of God that is about to infill this place. And then we need to honestly ask and search our heart. You need to honestly ask God. Many of you have already, when I was confessing what I was confessing, Many of you, the Holy Spirit was already telling you what yours were. The Holy Spirit had already been working on you this morning. I saw it in your faces. The Holy Spirit told me, I'm beating them up. I'm beating them up. I'm beating her up. I'm beating him up. I'm beating them up. Boom. You know, the Holy Spirit was beating people up. Y'all agree with me or not? And if the Holy Spirit wasn't beating you up, then you need to get right with God because there ain't a single one of us in here that does not have something we need to deal with in our lives. And so we must humble ourselves with the humbleness of heart that Ezra had. That humble heart that says, you know what, I need to check myself. I need to look at myself. I need to look inside of me and I need to see. And I need to be ashamed of my sin. I need to be ashamed of my sin. but he still sought God. He was ashamed, but he still sought God. You see, what some people do will become so ashamed of their sin that they won't turn to God. Don't do that. Be ashamed, but still go to God. Still seek him, okay? Go to him. And, and we must realize that even as Christians, if everyone in here is born again, and if you're not, I just want to tell you right now, right here, God loves you so much that he sent his only son to die on that old rugged cross so you can have salvation. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You are a sinner. I am a sinner. Together we are sinners. But God loves you and wants to save you. He doesn't want you to choose hell. He wants you to choose heaven by asking Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior. It's not enough to say, well, I believe in God. I believe there's a God. I believe there's a Jesus. That's not enough. Because Scripture is very clear and says that even the demons know, believe, and tremble at the name of Jesus. But they're not saved. They fell out of heaven. They were, in fact, cast out of heaven. And so it's not enough to just say, I believe there's a Jesus. There's a God. You have to ask Him to personally come into your heart. Ephesians chapter 2 says that. You must be born again. John chapter 3 makes that clear. You must be born again. Ask Jesus to come into your heart to save you, to forgive you, and to fill you with the Holy Spirit. All right. Psalm 139, 23 and 24 for you Christians. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. 
Have you ever asked God to search you? Have you ever asked God to look in your heart, look in your soul, to take a deep dive, to really just get in there and see what's going on? Have you ever done that? If you haven't, you need to. Now remember, this is for Christians. If you're, if you're not a Christian, I've already told you, you need saved. That's your first step. But if you're a Christian, you're a born-again believer, you need Jesus Christ to search your heart and to show you the wicked ways inside of you. Psalm 119, verse 18, Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Several different people throughout uh, this fast have been praying for God to remove scales and open eyes. Several different people. We get so tunnel visioned in our lives that we forget or we don't see where we're falling short of the glory of God. And you see, we need God to open our eyes and say, Lord, show me. Show me where I'm a sinner, Father. Show me where I've fallen short. Show me the wickedness that is within me. Because the world around you tells you you're great. The world around you tells you you're awesome. The world around you tells you you're perfect. But God says no. God says you mess up. God says you sin. And many of us hold that within us. So you need to honestly ask God to search you and to show you what's inside your heart, your mind, and your soul. Psalm 119, or Psalm 19, verses 7 and 11, through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Do you know the word of God to search yourself against it? Look how beautiful. It's enlightening. It's pure. It's clean. It's enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. And they are righteous. Remember that one that says the righteousness will go before? Are you walking in the law and precepts of God, the holy word? Are you studying? Are you learning? Are you applying it to your lives? Are you letting the law of the Lord change you and mold you and transform you? If you're not, then you're missing out. Would you agree? If you're not, look what you're missing out on. You can search for money. You can search for gold. You can search for silver. You can search for all the riches in the world. But the word of God is better than all of that. Every bit of it. And so that leads us to... Oh, I forgot part of it. Sorry. The law of the Lord is sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. You keeping the word of God? You using it? Letting it change you, mold you? Do you know it? Are you studying it? Are you placing it in your heart, treasuring it, loving the word of God? And then, after you have God search you, comes confession and forgiveness. The spiritual revival that that God is calling us to is hard. Friends, I'm not going to lie to you. If you do this right and you put every ounce of your heart, mind, soul, and strength into this, it will break you. It will break you. But I promise you, It will be worth it. It's hard. Even the toughest dudes that don't cry will be like me. You'll be crybabies if you let God change you. You, You'll really experience, and then you'll have sympathy for me and you'll stop making fun of me. (laughs) Listen, I will say this. With the utmost love and respect, even Allison will start crying. 
the hardest of hearts. I, I mean, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> Mid blow, she's blown her nose. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, all joking aside, if you do this, it's hard. But I promise you, it is so worth it. So, once God reveals the sin, once God reveals your sin, the very first thing, the very first thing, don't make excuses. Hmm. Casey, Pastor Casey, the very first thing, don't make excuses. That's to me. But I put it up there because I'm thinking it probably applies to many of you too. Amen. Because don't we naturally when it just starts saying, well, this and well, that and well, this and well, that. Don't we just naturally do that? Don't make excuses. Don't say it's the way you were raised. Don't say it's past things. Don't say anything like that. Just say, you know what? It's sin and it needs rooted out. It needs gone out of my life. You remember, God, God revealed this thought to me years ago, and I've used it many times over the years. You remember the song, Count Your Blessings, Name Them One by One? Well, flip that a little bit. Count your sins, name them one by one. You ever thought of that before? Name them. Name the sins. Because what we do is at the end of the day, oh God, I love you, forgive me of all my sins, thank you in Jesus' name. Count them. Call them. Name them. Get rid of them. It's not enough to just say, thanks, forgive me. No. If you told a lie, call it. Call it what it is. Don't go, well, you know, and I did this this morning, and, it, and, and I didn't mean it that way on the way to church. Because um, yesterday when Ray and Luke were leaving to go to work, they were here from 6 till 11.30 when they had to go to work. And, and Ray's like, Dad, you all right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm just tired. Dad, I'm fine. And, and, and telling her I was tired was not a lie. I, I didn't get much sleep the night before. I couldn't sleep. And so that was only a half truth. And this morning, Ray's like, see, I knew. I knew something was wrong, Dad. It's not bad enough. Never mind, I'm not going down that road. I'm going to get myself in trouble. I'm steering clear. That runway is a negatory, Ghost Rider. Mm -mm. The pattern is full. Whew, thank you, Lord, for shutting my mouth. I'd have paid for that one. <laughs> um, where was I going? I told a half-truth. And I was like, well, I didn't lie. This is what I, we're in the van on the way to church this morning. I'm like, well, I didn't lie. I just didn't tell you the whole truth. And I'm like, well, as I was saying that, the Lord said, that is a lie. And I'm like, well, that is a lie. That was a lie. I just told you. I only told you half of it. I wasn't lying. Like, I, I was tired. I just didn't tell you the whole thing. So I only told a half truth. Well, did you know that a half truth is a whole lie? And as soon as I'm saying that to Ray and the Holy Spirit's going, mm. I lied to you, Ray. Didn't mean to. It wasn't intentional. I'm sorry. You know how hard it is to tell your 17-year-old child in front of the three other siblings you lied to them and you're sorry for that? You know how hard that is? You ever done it before? Don't raise your hands. Parents, are you setting the right example? Are you saying you're sorry? Are you calling out your sins? If you won't even call them out to God, you definitely won't call them out in front of your family. Think about that for a minute. You definitely, if you're not coming to the throne of grace and saying, God, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. 
You definitely won't do it in front of your kids. You definitely won't do it in front of your spouse. Let me tell you. It's fearful to have to call out your sins by name. It is fearful. Especially to people. It is fearful to say, you know what? 89% of the time I've been walking like Christ, but man, 11% of the time, and I'm just picking arbitrary numbers. 11% of the time I've been doing this. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard enough to go to the Lord and do that. But then when he tells you, you know what, you need to call out in front of your spouse. You need to tell your kids, and then you need to tell the church. I'm not laughing in humor. I'm laughing in, really, Lord? Yeah. But you know, 2 Timothy 4.12 says, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. If you will walk in a sound mind in the power that comes through Jesus Christ, it is scary. There might be consequences you will have to face, but God will get you through it. And it will be better in the long run. And so, what God just told me a minute ago, you know, 30 seconds ago, the more I talk, the longer it is. It's like 45 seconds now. Uh, about 50 seconds now, you get the point, (laughs) is that there's about to be some change in some households. There's about to be some confessions take place. If you're on the receiving end of the confession, let me just give you this warning. This is what the Spirit's telling me to tell you. If you're on the receiving end of that, give grace. Give grace. We do not deserve it. Oh, my Lord, we don't deserve it. But you remember the scripture. God gave us grace for a little while. Give grace if you're receiving it. If someone's confessing some sin that they are called to confess to you, give grace. Don't let, don't let the spirit of anger swell up inside of you. Don't let the spirit of jealousy Take hold of you. Don't let the spirit of destruction grab a hold and cause issues. You see, if God's telling us to start confessing and getting real, then we got to give grace. But first, before you even go to your spouse or your kids or your parents or someone in here that you need to ask forgiveness, the first thing, You need to go up here. You need to come up here. And you need to get right. And you need to name it. When I say name it, I'm not doing that false gospel name it, claim it thing. I'm talking about name your sins, and then you can claim the forgiveness that Jesus Christ gives. That's the only name it and claim it we have. When God says you had hatred in your heart today, call the hatred by name in confession. Father, this week I had hatred. I was so angry. I hated that person. Father, will you forgive me and remove it? Father, I lied. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me and help me to never lie again? Father, I had a love of money. I had lust. I had pride. Name it. You know what your sins are. We get the idea. Don't just do the, we've sinned, forgive us, thank you, Jesus, and move on. Call them out. Call them out. Part of our confession is asking for forgiveness. First thing is, we ask God to search it. Search our hearts. Show us. Then we confess it. Then we ask forgiveness. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, If, 
if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My overwhelming thought the last couple days is I do not deserve it. That has consumed me because I don't. But God's promise is that he is faithful and righteous. Him, God himself. <laughs> because friends, we're not. We're not. But God in Jesus is faithful and righteous to forgive us. If we confess it. Friends, how many of you want forgiveness? I do. <clears throat> but before you can forgive, get forgiveness, you got to have confession. And then, we have this great word called Repentance. We've gone through some pretty hard steps so far, amen? But then we get to probably the hardest step in my estimation. I could be wrong. This might be different for you. But to me, it seems like this is the hardest step because what happens is you get this movement of the Holy Spirit in your life and you confess it, and, and he's showing you your sins, and, and you, you confess it, and then you ask forgiveness, and then you're on this spiritual high, right? And you just feel amazing, and then all of a sudden, if yours is the love of money, if that's your problem that you've just been seeking after the love of money, the next day some, some dude or dudette will show up and be like, man, I got this great business opportunity, you need to jump in with me, it's going to take like the next five weekends, but you really need to do this. You know what the devil does? He tempts you. He knows your weaknesses, friends. He knows them better than you do. He, his demons have studied you. He knows how to get to you. And so if you confess jealousy, pride, lust, love of money, lying, whatever it is, you're on the spiritual high and the devil and his demons are going to show up and go, Here's an opportunity to sin. What you going to do? And what do we always do? Not always. What do we naturally do? We fall right into temptation, don't we? And that's how we get from up here all the way back here. Don't we? Because we showed up and we were on our spiritual high. We did everything we needed to do. And then the devil shows up and we go like this. And then we're back at square one where we're going like this. Over here. Hey, I made it back. Yay, look, I did all these things. And then the devil shows up. And it, is it me or does it feel like, and I hate using that word feel, does it seem like we are in an endless circle of non-victory? Am I the only one that sees that? That it just seems like we're in an endless cycle of non-victory. But I read John 10.10, 10, okay? I read that. I've committed that to memory. I've committed that to heart. I've committed that to my soul. Because what Jesus said, let, let me get this to you right here, right clear, right now. What Jesus said. Do you hear that? Do you hear that name, Jesus? You see the demons and the devils, they tremble. At the name of Jesus. I'm getting ready to go to a place where, where paganism and, and all of that's real. But you know what's going to happen? As soon as my feet hit that ground, the demons are going to go. I'm out of here. Because he's got Jesus. 
But let me get back to where I was telling you. I want you to hear that name of Jesus. I'm sick and tired of people saying, God, God, God. You go, wait, what? Here's the deal with that. I haven't forgot John 10.10. I'm, I'm squirreling, but stay with me. Here's the deal. The demons can become your God. Your TVs can become your God. Food, phones, spouses, children. You see, it's not enough to just say, I believe in God. You got to have Jesus. So, John 10 10, the devil comes to steal to kill, to destroy. But Jesus said, I came to give life and life more abundantly. I don't think you heard me. I think y'all better stand up. Stand up, come on. Stand up, you need to receive this. You go, wait, you've never had us do that. I know I haven't. Let the spirit move. Quit quenching it. If you're sitting there doubting this, sit your butt down because you're not ready to receive it. John 10.10, 10, the devil comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But Jesus said, I came to give life and life more abundantly. Woo! All right, you can sit. We're not done. We got like a 45 minutes left. Sit down. You needed to receive that. You needed to hear that. You needed to take in the word of God. Y'all don't understand. Y'all don't understand. The spirit is moving like you've never experienced in your life. You go, yeah, I have. no, you have not. Because the miracles, the tongues, the gifts of healing, the things that are about to break out in this church, y'all Baptists ain't never had it before. Yeah, come on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, glory, hallelujah. Whew. I'm telling you what. I, yeah, we'll save that. The point of John 10.10 10 is to tell you. <laughs> you all thought I forgot. I might have, but the Holy Spirit didn't. Amen. The whole point was that we all agreed. We just feel like we're in this endless cycle of non-victory. But my Jesus said we're overcomers. Amen. My Jesus said we, he came to give us abundant life. Amen. Stop, stop letting the demons tread on us. How about we take them back and we tread on them? How about we tell the devil and his demons where they can go? How about we say, we're done with you. you you're going to attack, but in the name of Jesus and his blood, I'm done. I ain't going to receive you, demons. I ain't going to receive the reports that the demons bring. I'm going to receive Jesus and him crucified. Jesus. Come on now. You know, my world's about to be rocked. I'm about to go to Kenya. I'm getting eye level with you. Not quite, but we're getting there. My world's about to be rocked. I'm getting ready to go to Kenya. And I'm telling you, there's something that, oh, this is a different atmosphere down here. Oh, it's warm up there. The spirit is moving. And, and down here, you guys got something different going on. But let me tell you something. I'm getting ready to go to Kenya. And there's about, yeah, I'm walking on the pew, Isaiah. It'll clean up. I don't care. You know who don't care? The Holy Spirit. We're about to see something break out over in Kenya. And it's going to, that spirit is going to move so mightily, Mike. When we come back, you're going to go out to those Gideons and you're going to say, y'all need to come get a taste of the Spirit of God. Because what, what, what they brought back is nothing like we've ever experienced before. It's about to be amazing. It's about to be amazing. It's going to soften hard hearts. Not you. I'm just saying. I love you, Allison. Why do you do that? Why she do that every time? I don't know. But listen, let me tell you something. The Spirit of God is mighty. The Spirit of God is moving like we've never seen. People are going to say, y'all seem like y'all Pentecostals. I ain't a Pentecostal. I ain't a Baptist. I'm a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, and I ain't held by no denominational names. I'm held by the name of Jesus. Y'all didn't hear me. Jesus. 
I think y'all need to say that along with me. Jesus. Woo! I'm sorry if I just spit on you. <laughs> Woo! It got real, didn't it? You know, you, you know that's something that's, that's going to be... Uh, it ain't, I, don't, I don't know... How do I say that? I don't know how to say it because it's not a problem. It's not an issue. Did the lights just go out? <laughs> I, I just saw a movement. Um, but uh, what I was saying was, we're going to be packed, like 100, 200 people in a church, and we're going to be like this, and I'm going to be going, you know, I, I know the Spirit's going to be having me go, and I'm going to be going crazy, and, and I'm going to be preaching. And I, know, I got it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Joe and Jacob are going to stand right in front. I'll just spit in their face the whole time. <laughs> there, <laughs> there you go. Y'all about to get some holy water. <laughs> They're going to come back and go, we got baptized 75 times while we were over there. <laughs> Listen, listen, <laughs> I don't know if everybody knows this or not, and, and this is just a, a door opening that, that God provided that is absolutely, unequivocally, unbelievably amazing. I found out Friday, and I was broke, okay? I mean, that started the process, okay? We got invited to two different schools while we're over there. One has 800 students one has a thousand students, plus teachers and staff. What I realized, and that God brought to my attention Friday, is that I'm going to be over there preaching to thousands. Did you hear that? Thousands of people. And all of a sudden, I'm like, huh, we've got 300 of these Jesus loves you's. We've got like, at the time, 300 of these bracelets, I'm like, we are woefully unqualified for what we're about to give out. <laughs> we're going to have to decide where these are going to go and, where they're, and who's going to use them and how they're going to use them. And all of a sudden, I, I messaged uh, Jamie, and, and, and I know she wouldn't want me sharing this because she doesn't want the glory, but her and Brock are like, all right, no problem. Brr. I just ordered 2,000, and I went, what? Well, that'll cover the two schools. <laughs> <laughs> Brock's back there like why did you say my name from the pulpit you said Brock I don't like Brock being named that's four <laughs> look at the look he's giving me <laughs> I got your son now I got you <laughs> y'all forgot where I was at didn't you I didn't we're at repentance we're at repentance. You see, the Holy Spirit says that we got to repent. It's not enough to just say, search me, God, know me, God, show me my sins. I'll confess it, and I'll ask forgiveness. Those are great. Praise be to God, those are great. But there's one more step you got to do. You have to do in order to see a change in your life, and that's called repentance. That is where you turn from your sins. Numbers 15, or sorry, uh, Acts 3.19, therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Do you want some refreshing times of the Lord? You got to turn from it. You got to turn from your sins and go back to what you knew was right and do what's right. That's the key to this is you've got to turn from the sin. So when the devil comes knocking, when the devil comes knocking and says, hey, look at this. Say that. Do that. Go here. Do that. You go, ha, I got you, you dirty devil. In the name of Jesus, be gone. In the name of Jesus, be gone. You know, that's something that's amazing that's happened recently. When I say, when, when I'm preaching in the spirit and, and I say Jesus, it's, it's almost like it's a singing. Has anybody noticed that? I can't describe it. Like I, it's, I, it's other than the Holy Spirit. It's amazing. I'm just, I'm in amazement at what God's doing. Amen. Look at the word in Greek here. 
uh, actually Hebrew, sorry, uh, metaneo, and it is from those two uh, Hebrew root words that, if you look at the etymology, uh, to think differently or afterwards, i.e. reconsider, morally feel compunction, repent. So what it's saying is, you know, like when, when you were lying and you had no problem with lying and you're like, I'm lying and, you know, whatever, I'm not getting caught. When you repent, you go, that was sin. I'm never doing it again. <clears throat> if, you, if you love money, you go, you know what? I, I don't love money anymore. Money, the love of money is the root of all evil is what Paul told Timothy. If you, if you were looking at things you shouldn't be looking at, you go, you know what, I'm disgusted by it. I never want to look at that again. You think differently. Adrian Rogers, I heard him one time say it this way, that you, you literally are turning your back on where you were with sin. Where before the sin was in front of you, you partook in it, you literally turn your back and say no more. I want no more sin in my life. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to think differently. Not only turn my back, but move away from it. And you move away from it by moving towards the Lord. And so you got to repent. you got to stop the sins. You don't just go, hey, God, forgive me, and then you go out and do it 20 more times and be like, hey, God, forgive me, and then you do it 20 more times. You're like, hey, God, forgive me. You get the idea? What do you think Jesus thinks as, as, as he's, you know, hanging on the cross and he knows every one of your sins? He knows every one of my sins. And he's hanging on the cross and he's going, Casey, you keep saying you're sorry, but you keep doing it. Casey, you keep saying you're sorry, but you keep doing it. Casey, you keep saying you're sorry, but you keep doing it. Can you imagine what Jesus must have been thinking at our sins when we say we're sorry, but we keep doing it? He was thinking of you and me. That's heartbreaking to think of it that way. Then we go to remembrance, uh, Numbers 15, 40. So that you may remember to do all my commandments and be holy to your God. So you, and these are like simultaneous, okay? Even though they're different steps, you repent and you remember at the same time. You turn your back on the sin and you remember the good things. You remember the law. You remember the right things. You remember to do the things that God told you to do. So you've turned your back on sin, you've repented, while saying, I'm going to walk to, towards you, God. I'm going to do the right things. So this is a simultaneous, even though they're different steps, this happens at the same time. Does that make sense? Turn your back on sin, remember what God says and do it. Turn your back on sin, remember what God says and do it. Well, I don't really know what God says. Then get in your word. Remember that at the beginning? Read your Bible. Know the, God, the word of God. His precepts, his laws, they're better than pure gold. They're sweeter than honey from the honeycomb. Amen? All right. Here's a quote I heard a long time ago that makes a lot of sense. Most wrong things in your life started by forgetting the things that were right. Think about that. After you became a Christian, doesn't that make a lot of sense? After you became a Christian, you were on fire and you started falling back because you started forgetting to do the right things. Makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. So, if you've forgotten to forgive, if you have unforgiveness, you've forgotten forgiveness. If you have pride, you've forgotten the humility that Christ calls us to. If, you, if you're a drunkard, you forgot what it means to be uh, drunk in the spirit, not in wines and spirits. You, if, if, you, if you're lusting, you forgot that Jesus said lust in your heart is adultery. If you have vengeance in your heart, you forgot Jesus says vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. You see, all of these sins are because you forgot to do the right things. You forgot the word of God. And then the very final thing. The very final thing. And I believe this is absolutely necessary. And some, some people will do this in different ways. I understand that. I get that. But it is critical 
It is critical. And you're all thinking, what could this be? What could this be? Some of y'all have done an amazing job at stepping out of your comfort zones in this next area. Some of y'all still use excuses. Y'all like, are you going to? I know. I know. You ready? The very last thing after all of this happens, you better praise. When God has done a movement in your life, when God has done something miraculous, you better start stepping up and praising Jesus Christ. When he has done a move and called you out of things and, and is doing healings and, and giving you different spiritual gifts and using you and moving mountains and, and giving you all of these different things, you better be praising him. Because if you come in and you just stand there, or you mumble the words, You're not praising him. You see, because if you'll do a deep dive in revelation of what praise looks like, you're going to be astounded if you don't know. And every one of us should just absolutely be falling down praising Jesus Christ. We should absolutely just become undone. When Isaiah went into the presence of God in, in chapter 5 or 6, it says that as he came into the presence of God, he became undone. Have you ever become undone in the presence of God? When we're singing praise, if you close your eyes, Stop looking around. Stop worrying about the person who's off key. Stop worrying about sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so. And you just close your eyes and you focus on Jesus. You will be able to absolutely just praise him in a way you never have before. Let go. Let go. And when, when God has done a work in you, and you have received that cleansing, that pureness that the scriptures told us about. And you want nothing more than, than to serve Jesus. You are going to want to praise him. Because let, let me give you a litmus test of where you're at with God. If you can come in here and you don't praise, you're not right with God. Think on that for a minute. If you stand there and you're not praising, you're not right with God. Because every instance that we see, praise breaks out when God does a movement. Every single time. Because you cannot help but praise the one who forgave you and gave you eternal life. You cannot help but praise the one who healed you when the doctor said there was no healing. You cannot help but praise the one who changed you from an evil, mean, horrible person to a loving, compassionate, caring person who gives people Jesus. You can't help but praise the one who delivered you out of the fire like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You can't help but praise the one when you were in the lion's den and he pulled you out like he did with David and Daniel. You can't help but be the one who praises God when he shows up, when all hope was lost, when everything seemed like there was nothing, and you can't help but praise him when he shows up in your storm. You can't help but give, yeah, praise God. You can't help but praise him. You can't help but sing glory to God. You can't help but throw your hands up. You can't, I, I do not want to hear any more excuses whatsoever. Do not tell me any more excuses why you can't praise God. Because there is no reason, unless you have a physical problem, there is no reason why you should not be praising God. If you can't come into this church and praise God and feel the Spirit of God, the problem is you. 
It is not the Spirit. He is here. He is moving. He is touching lives. He is working on people in this church. If you can't praise, it's not on this church. It's not on the Spirit of God. It is on you. And I just made some people mad, and you know what? I love you. I mean it, but I don't care. You can get mad all you want. Take it up with Jesus. Amen. Hebrews 13, 15. Through him then let us continually, oh boy, offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that gives thanks to his name. You wanted proof? I'll give it. <laughs> When you stand there and you don't sing or you just kind of mumble along, you're not offering a sacrifice of praise. You're not praising God. You're not offering him anything. He's like, why are you even here? You're not getting ready to receive my word. You're not getting ready to give me what I'm due. He says, what are you here for? You read that? Let me read it again just in case there's anybody that didn't hear it the first time. Through him, who's him? Let us continually, not one time, not every once in a while, continually. How many times are you talking about Jesus in your daily walk? How many times are you praising God when good news comes, bad news comes? How many times are you at work and somebody says something and you go, praise Jesus? Well, they might think I'm crazy. Who cares? Let them think you're crazy. Label me a Jesus freak. Amen? continually offer up a sacrifice. You know, we've been in a month of fasting, and, and we're talking about sacrifice. Check it out. Add this to your sacrifice, friends. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. When you sing and you praise God and you praise Jesus, Guess what? You're offering a sacrifice of praise to God. Can you believe that? Can you believe that when you're doing that, that you're absolutely offering a sacrifice to God? A sacrifice of praise that you are praising the Lord God Almighty when you're singing, when you're raising your hands, when you're praising. Isn't that something? But you see, what happens is, we get distracted. We look at people walking when they get up or come in. And I'm not picking on them. I'm picking on us. Because we all look and we all pay attention, don't we? Instead of just going, you know what, that's really none of my business. I need to focus on Jesus. But we get distracted. And that's one of the things that I've heard over and over and over through this fasting. Is man, it's been nice to get rid of the distractions in my life and so what we're about to see here in a second is a movement of the spirit of God the Holy Spirit fall on this place he's been here he's been working he's been singing through the team he's been preaching through me y'all have felt the presence of the Holy Spirit you guys have been absolutely just, just getting convicted and, and knowing what you need to do and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this quick, this prayer, so that that way I, I'm not quenching the Holy Spirit because there's people who need to do business up here. And if the worship team quits singing and they go down on their knees, don't worry about it. Just go with it. Because it, what, what, what God's saying is that every single one of us needs to be up here. Every single one of us has something that we need to deal with. And so this morning... First and foremost, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you today that he died on that cross for your sins. It's as simple as the ABCs. You admit you're a sinner. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You believe on Jesus Christ that he is God in the flesh, that he lived sinless, that he died on that cross, rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave on the third day and sits at the right-hand throne of the Father in heaven to this day. And then you choose to follow him. That's what all this is about is following Jesus. Admit you're a sinner. 
Believe on Jesus and choose to follow him. If you're not saved, I invite you to come grab me and let's do that. Let's ask Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior. If you are a born-again believer, then, then I'm inviting you to come up and have personal revival at this altar. And then, when you do, and this happens, this movement of the Spirit, go back or stay up here and praise Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we bless you, we praise you, we love you. Father, we thank you now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your move here this morning, Father. We thank you that you have just been on fire. And Father, your Holy Spirit is, is burning inside of us, is indwelling us, is moving mightily, Father. And we just pray now in the name of Jesus that as you've been convicting, as you've been moving, as you've been working, that people will come up and deal with you as you see fit, as you called them to, Father, that they will get right with you, whether that's salvation, whether that's rededication, whatever the sin is that has been holding them back. Uh, Father, we just pray that they will come now. Come by the masses, Father, and get right with you, Father. Now in the name of Jesus, let your spirit pull them up in Jesus' name. And everybody said, the altar is open.